part four of our series through the eyes of John, and today we're actually going to move backward from last week, backward chapter, one chapter, and look at a story from John chapter five. Um, if you get our email or if you're on our Facebook page, you know that I sent a special word out because as I was studying this and, and, and putting this message together in prayer, it just really hit me that this is a message that we need. It's a message of hope and encouragement and healing. How many need that today? Come on, how many could use that today? And so I just wanted to make sure that we got the word out and you could invite somebody or you could be here. And obviously we have a wonderful crowd today and I'm just thankful that you're gonna get to hear not my words, but the word of God today. Let's pray and then we'll get into the content. Father, we sense your presence here this morning. We, we in the early service, you were just so wonderful, such a sweet presence. And God, I thank you right now that your very presence, your glory, your manifest presence is here because the body of Christ is here. And so right now, Lord, let your word come alive like we sang. Let it awaken our spirit. Lord, get me and my personality and my, my uh, weakness to, to communicate out of the way. And let your word go forth. Let it be prophetic and powerful and life-giving and hope-filled this morning. I'm praying, God, that you would do a healing work in our soul, in our heart this morning. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. So as you saw real quickly with the announcements tonight, everybody say tonight, tonight at 6 p.m., and we're probably going to have to do it in here and not the community room, but uh, we're going to have our informational meeting for the School of Discipleship. So be sure if you signed up that you're here and we, we're going to have a little extra food. We're going to have some finger foods, and we, we got a little extra. So if you really feel like, you know, I didn't register, I didn't pre-register, and you really feel drawn to come tonight, you're not signing up for the school. This is strictly to hear the vision again and to ask questions, and we've got some material to put in your hands about the School of Discipleship, which launches in the fall. But tonight, I would love for you to come and hear about it, ask your questions. We have child care. We're going to have some light refreshments tonight at 6 p.m., right in here. So please do that. So our story today takes place, and this is kind of cool since we're going into summer, takes place next to a pool. A pool, yeah, right in the Bible. It's right there. We're going to read about it. And I don't know about you, but when I think of a pool, I have good thoughts. I grew up in East Cobb down here, Marietta, and in a, in a subdivision, and we had a neighborhood pool. Now, it wasn't fancy like y'all bridge mill people, okay? It wasn't, wasn't, it wasn't all that, okay? But it was a nice pool. It was a good pool. And I, I practically lived down there. And in those days, I mean, my mom at eight years old would send me off, literally, just go on, go on to the pool. You just go to the pool. And I, she's watching. She's like, I did not. But you did. You really did. And I was fine with that. I was good with that. We can't do that these days. But it's against the law. You'd be put in jail. But anyway, it's fine. <laughs> We had a blast down there, and I became a really strong swimmer. I loved the pool. I was on the swim team for 12 years. I was in shape. It was a wonderful thing. I don't know what happened, but anyway, I became a lifeguard. Me and David Hasselhoff together, I mean, you know. I just choose to keep my shirt on. I don't want to embarrass you guys at all, okay? But I, hey, I was the sharks and minnows king. Nobody, if you don't know what Sharks and Minnows is, I don't even know why you're alive today. That's the best <laughs> game ever. The best, and I was the best at, anyway, I'm reliving the 80s. That's fine. For most of us, when we think about a pool, we think about fun and laughter and having a good time, vacation. Well, not in our story today. There was a pool called Bethesda in Jerusalem. And in ancient times, even before Jesus, it provided water for the temple the pool was surrounded by these huge colonnades, five of them that provided these porches with shade. And so people who were infirm, ill, sick, paralyzed, they would gather here and really end up living under these porches to get out of the sun. And they would, if they didn't have family, see, there was no welfare. There was no financial system in place. If they couldn't work, which they couldn't because they were sick or they were ill, they were paralyzed, then they, there was no way for them to make any money. They didn't have any family to take them in and care for them. They ended up here, living here. Not, not, not 
just hanging out at the pool. They lived here all the time. This was not a fun place. This was not a place of laughter and joy. It was a place of pain and hopelessness. It was a place that nobody wanted to go, nobody wanted to visit, and certainly nobody wanted to end up living there. But there was another reason that people gathered at this pool of Bethesda. Maybe you've heard this. There was a legend that an angel would come down and stir the water, right? Have you heard this? And stir the water. When the water was stirred, the first person to get into the pool after the angel had stirred the water would be healed. Now, the Bible does not support this. It's folklore. It's a legend. And Jesus was about to come and debunk this urban legend. Now, we're going to go verse by verse like we always do, but then, then when I'm finished, we're going to watch this scene as portrayed by the actors in The Chosen and they do a fantastic job with this, and we'll do that, that at, at the end. So if you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 5. John chapter 5, today on the screen, it's going to be in the New Living Translation, beginning with verse 1. Everybody ready for the word? Yes. Only seven of you. Are you ready for the word? Yes. Amen. Amen. I'm like, there's 300 people in here. So seven of you. Anyway, Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city, near the sheep gate, was the pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Verse 3 says, crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on these porches. So I want you to get the picture. Don't just let this be black words on white paper. I want you to get the picture. John tells us it wasn't just a handful of sick. It was crowds, crowds of sick people, hopeless people in this situation. It was a place of misery. I want you to even think about how it would smell. The flies, the, 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 the infection, all of, just horrible. My first uh, full-time ministry position in my early 20s, um, so like five, six years ago, uh, was, <laughs> can't help it was at a church in Tennessee, in East Tennessee, in Lenore City, Tennessee, and I was the music, it was a smaller church, I was the music pastor and the youth pastor, and part of my, it was an older church, older people, and part of my job was to go visit, listen to this, in four different nursing homes every week, four different nursing, and now this, what I'm about to say is nothing against nursing homes, or any of you work in one, or in hospital, or care, it's hard work. And there's never enough people. So this is not against that. But sometimes you would go in there and I would go into a room and the smell would just hit me. And the person had been laying in their own waist. They had not had anybody to help them. And I would have to go and, and uh, talk to the nurse or whatever. And most of the time it wasn't on them. They just couldn't get to everybody, you know. But the place just, the whole feeling as you walk in the door of these nursing homes, and you know you've been there, it's, it's hard it's, it feels oppressed because of the, just the hopeless uh, lack of hope in those places. Well, we've all felt that, but this would be a hundred times worse. Are you feeling that today? I want you to feel this. So verse five, one of the men lying there, get this, had been sick for 38 years. The inference is that he had been lying here and living here for most of that time. Now, all of us have bad days. Some of us have bad seasons of time, difficult seasons, maybe even a year or two years where we're going through something, but I don't know of anybody here probably that could compare to what this man was going through and had been going through for virtually all of his life. I mean, think about why he was there. Of course, his body was broken, but he was there because there was no one to take him in. There was no one. His family, if he had it, did not step up. They gave up. And to me, that's worse than anything, amen? That would be harder. The rejection that he probably felt from that would be worse than what was wrong with his body. So just think about it. Almost four decades in this condition and in that horrible place, this man would have been completely void of any hope that his life could be any, what, different. 
This wasn't a season of time for this man. This was a way of life. I want you to get that in your soul. Verse 6, when Jesus saw him. I love that. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? Would you like to get well? Now, to me, that's a very easy question to answer. How many of you would be like, um, yes, get me out of this horrible place, heal my, yes, 100%, yes. But understand, in 38 years, nobody had offered to do anything. This was his way of life. This was his lot in life. This is just who he was. And he had no hope of anything changing. And so I don't think he he could even, in the condition he was in, could even comprehend what was happening. Comprehend the question that Jesus was asking. And listen to me. I want you to hear me. This condition of hopelessness can happen to us. It can happen in our heart, in our life. Our pain, listen, our suffering can become a way of life. The man felt trapped in his condition, trapped in his suffering, trapped in this place. Maybe that's how you feel today. Maybe you feel trapped in your circumstances. I want you to hear me, church, and this is not cliche. This is the word of the living God. No matter how trapped you feel, God can minister to your deepest needs. God can. Say God can. can. Say it again in faith. Amen. There's no valley so low that his love can't reach you. Isn't that right, Matt? There's no tragedy too severe that his grace can't uphold you and sustain you. There's no depression, there's no darkness that's so deep that his light and his love can't penetrate it and overcome it. David said in Psalm 23, which we all should know, the Lord is my shepherd. He, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. And I love this. He restores. Say restores. He restores my soul. Today is about your soul. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. All the battle, come on, takes place there. And then it's fleshed out in your flesh, right? The battle's not in your flesh. The battle is in your emotion, in your mind. And he says, no, he restores. Some of you need Jesus to restore your soul this morning. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Here's verse four. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why, David? For you are The word of God never, never, never says that we won't go through suffering and through pain and through tragedy and loss. Matter of fact, it says the opposite. It says we will. The difference between us and the world is that they have no hope and we have the hope of Jesus Christ. We have the hope to know that no matter what we step into, no matter what we go through in our life, we never have to be alone. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. Come on for that hope. Again, David declares in Psalm 139, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? That's, that's a strange thing to say, isn't it? Hold on, just time. I, I didn't do this last service. I just feel the spirit quicken my heart. Why would he want to flee? Why would he want to get away from the spirit of God? What did Adam and Eve do in the garden after they had sinned? What'd they do? They hid. Because of what? Shame. 
Oh, I feel that. Absolutely, we try to hide. Absolutely, we try to get out of the presence of God because we're ashamed. But David said, where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, if you study that out, he's talking about hell. If my life is hell and I'm just like, leave me alone and leave me in my hell, it says, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, that sounds like depression to me. That sounds like anxiety to me. Those things are dark things and we sometimes think that that darkness is gonna overwhelm us. But David reminds us right here, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day for darkness is as light to you. My God, you may feel trapped this morning in your condition, in your anxiety, in your fear, in your suffering. But this story about this man reminds us, listen, that Jesus sees you. Jesus sees your condition, he sees your heart, he sees your pain, he sees what you're going through and he wants to come in and help you. He's offering that this morning. He says, what can I do? Do you want to be helped? He knows all about it. And he wants to help in three ways. I didn't put this on the screen, but he wants to help through his body. This, look around, this is the body of Christ. We are his hands. We are his feet. We are his love. We are his help. He wants to help you. When you're going through hell on earth, the enemy runs, wants you to run away from the church. The enemy wants you to hide alone so that he can take you out. When you're hurting, maybe you are today, you're watching and you're hurting. What we need to do is run to the church, to the body of Christ, not away. Secondly, he wants to help you through his word. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Right now, you're hearing the preached word of God. You're not hearing my opinion. You're hearing the word of God. And come on, that's how he wants to help us through a word. And then, thank the Lord, the third way is that his very spirit, Christ in us, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Hope, hope, hope. Anybody feel this? And just like with this man, he's just simply asking the question, would you like to get well? Would you like help? Not a trick question. Let's get back to our story and see what the man does. Verse seven, Jesus asked him and then he says, I can't. That's a strange answer, but maybe not for him. I can't. Jesus said, do you you want to be healed? I can't. The sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up, when the angel comes. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. I can't, I I, I can't. Did Jesus ask that? Did he ask why you haven't been healed? Did he ask why are you sitting under this porch? Did he ask what did you do to get yourself into this mess? Did he ask any of those things? No, he said, do you wanna be well? Does that complain? Oh, then, 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 then he answers, he says, I can't. And here come the excuses. I can't because nobody will help me. I can't because I can't get into the pool. I can't, I can't because these people get ahead of me. They catch a break and they always end up in the front of the line and I always end up in the back. Does that sound familiar at all, it does to me because I've said it. 
I've said it to the Lord. I'm the only one, I'm sure. (laughs) Do you ever feel like God is blessing everybody except you? You don't have to put up your hands, fine. Do you ever feel like that your friends or people that you know, they're getting ahead in life, moving on, advancing in life, leaving you behind? That God's just blessing everything they do, everything they touch, their family, their kids are beautiful and they they got the pictures on Facebook and they're like all happy. You're like, dear God, my kids hate each other. (laughs) Theirs do too, it's okay. (laughs) You know down deep, right, that that's not true and yet it feels so true. And here's why, here's why it feels true. Look at the screen. Sometimes we get so focused on our problem that we can't see the solution right in front of us. The son of the living God, God incarnate, was standing in front of this man. I get it. I get his issue and I certainly get mine because I live in my body. And I understand it with you that we get focused on the problem instead of Jesus, the solution, because life comes at us hard. Somebody say amen or oh me. Maybe maybe you get passed over again and again and again. Maybe we feel invisible to the world. Maybe tragedy strikes. Things don't work out like we had planned. And so we build up these walls to defend our emotions and defend how we feel. But the problem is that doesn't help at all. The walls simply become our prison. We can't see anything else but the other side of our problems. We can't see anything but our own insecurities, our own shame, our own problems, our own pain and suffering, our own shortcomings. This, listen, you gotta hear me, please, please. This is the condition that the enemy of your soul wants to trap you in for the rest of your life. Because if he can keep you inside those walls, he may lose your soul. If he can't have your soul, he wants your joy. If he can't have your soul, he wants your testimony. If he can't have your soul, he wants your gifting that you had to give to the world. If he can't have your soul, he wants your victory. Satan wants to destroy your soul, destroy your emotions. Destroy your mind. Why? Because he knows with you in that condition, listen, it will be almost impossible to hear the clear voice of God. But I have good news. What is impossible with man, my Bible says, is possible with God. Go ahead. I want somebody to hear me today. God is calling you out. As a matter of fact, the solution, the answer is not a thing, it's a person. The solution is in the person of Jesus Christ and he's standing right outside the door of your wall and he's knocking. And he's longing that you would let him. He will not kick the door down. He's longing that you would let him in, become vulnerable enough to let him in and help you. So today, just for a few minutes, okay, I want you to stop thinking about what went wrong. I want you to put aside what you're lacking, what you think you need that you don't have, or how the thing didn't go the way you wanted it to go. Put that 
I'm not diminishing that. I'm not diminishing the pain that that caused, the suffering. I'm not diminishing the addiction or whatever it is that you're facing. But what I am saying is that just for a few minutes, will you open the door of your heart, open the door of your spirit so that you can hear the clear voice of Jesus and not get it all muddled up in your mind, but hear him clearly say, do you want to be well? I feel the Holy Spirit. Verse eight, Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat and walk. Instantly, the man was healed. Let's watch the story. Shalom. Me? Yes. Shalom. I have a question for you. For me. I don't have many answers. But I'm listening. Do you want to be healed? Who are you? We'll get to that later. But my question remains. Will you take me to the water? <laughs> Look, I'm having a really bad day. You've been having a bad day for a long time. So? Sir, I have no one to help me into the water when it's stirred up. And when I do get close, the others step down in front of me. And so... Look at me. Look at me. That's not what I asked. I'm not asking you about who's helping you or who's not helping or who's getting in your way. I'm asking about you. <laughs> I've tried. For a long time, I know. And you don't want false hope again, I understand. But this pool, it has nothing for you. It means nothing. And you know it. But you're still here. Why? I don't know. You don't need this pool. You only need So, do you want to be healed? So let's go. Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Free to walk, like he said. Don't 
forget your bed. Why does this matter? Because you're not coming back here. That life is over. Everything changes now. recently saw a story about a man named Paul Baroni, true story. When he was 17 years old, he was arrested and convicted for murder, which he did commit, and spent four decades, about the same amount of time, in prison, 40 years. When he was 57 years old, he got out free. Can you imagine that long in a horrible place? out, finally, finally free. But he wasn't able to acclimate to his freedom. He was afraid, full of fear, full of anxiety. And so he faked, he faked a, a, a robbery, stuck his finger in his jacket, wasn't a real gun. Of course he was arrested and this is on, on record. He, the police say that he begged them to take him back to prison. Read another story. This is a much older story. Happened in the 1800s, I believe, about a bear in Germany. It was a part of a roadside zoo. And this bear had a cage that was 10 feet long, and it would pace 10 feet forward, 10 feet back, all day long back and forth, back and forth. The bear got old. They sold the bear to an animal sanctuary and they're like, we're finally gonna get, let this bear go free in our animal sanctuary, protected, but yet he can roam and, and be a bear. They put the cage out. They opened the door. You could probably know the bear went 10 foot forward, looked and 10 foot back in the cage. They finally built a fire at the closed end and scared the bear out. The bear came out, they moved the cage, but guess what happened? The bear paced back and forth about 10 feet. Eventually they had to put the bear down because he could never acclimate to his freedom. <laughs> You're like, pastor, why would you tell us that depressing story after this? Well. Sometimes, just like with the prisoner, sometimes just like the bear or the man in our story, we can become so familiar with our pain and with our condition that we're scared to try to change it, that we're scared to do anything, that we're frozen and paralyzed. We might dream of freedom, but in the end, we're actually afraid of it. I want you to hear me. Jesus is calling you out of that fear. He's calling you out of your walls and protective barriers that you've put up for years and years and years. He's standing at the door and knocking because Jesus created you to be free in him. He did not create you to live behind the walls of depression, the walls of hurt, the, the walls of loss. He created you. He died to set you free of that. He said in John 8, 36, so if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. We're not talking about physical freedom. I hope you understand that. I'm thankful to live in the greatest nation with all the problems we have. It's still the greatest nation in the world. I'm thankful to live in the United States of America, the land, the free, <clears throat> the home of the brave, but that's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about spiritual freedom. We're talking about setting your soul free. God created you to be free. 
So I want this physical healing that we've watched today, we've studied today, to become a picture of how God wants to heal our soul. Physical healing is wonderful, and I believe in it. How many else? How many believe in physical? I believe in it all day long because I know God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he still heals. But your soul is more important because it's eternal. I want the pool in the story to represent, listen, the hopeless offerings of the world to bring you freedom and healing. The hopeless offerings of the world that do not work. They're just band-aids. They're just band-aids over a problem that goes much deeper into your soul. Alcohol will not set you free. Alcohol will bind you. Drug addiction will not, it just puts a band-aid and numbs the pain for a little while. You know what I'm saying is true. Working overtime, sir, ma'am, working and working and making more money and thinking that's going to bring you the joy and the hope, it will not. It will not. Only the joy of the Lord and the assurance that we are saved and set free through his blood will bring the joy and the hope and the strength that we need and the freedom that we long for in our heart. My God, I feel him in this house. Jesus said, you don't need the pool. You only need me. Church, we don't need the world. We don't need the false healing. We don't need the illusions of freedom that we see crammed down our throat. Isaiah, I mean, I'm sorry, Psalm. This is it, I'm done. Psalm 34, 18 says, God is near to the brokenhearted. You're hurting today, that means he's right there. You may have a wall up, but he's, he's there, he's there, and he's knocking. Will you let him in? Bow your heads. 